Hello everybody. My name is Stefan Evangelista and I teach English at Trinity College and the University of Oxford. Um, I am the author of a book entitled Citizens of Nowhere, Literary Cosmopolitanism in the British Fin de Siècle, which is going to be published next year. So first of all, I would like to thank Matthew and Michael for inviting me to take part in this opening event of their network on Scottish cosmopolitanism at the Fin de Siècle. And then I'll uh, go straight ahead for my talk. So I would like to begin with an image. John William Waterhouse's Diogenes dates from 1882. The setting is typical of Waterhouse's historicism and more generally of the fascination of Victorian artists for the classical past. It portrays the Greek cynic philosopher Diogenes of Sinope, who was famous for his Spartan, eccentric and antisocial behaviour. Diogenes believed in absolute virtue, refused to own property and lived in a discarded ceramic jar in the marketplace. Waterhouse contrasts the stern figure of the philosopher with those of the three fashionable women on the marble steps on the left-hand side of the canvas. Draped in colourful clothes and carrying fancy accessories, they regard the shady Diogenes with a mixture of curiosity and condescension. Diogenes was an exile who came to Athens from a Greek city that is now in Turkey. One of his most controversial gestures was that when he was questioned about his origins, he would reply, I am a citizen of the world. The word he used was the Greek cosmopolites, refusing to identify with a specific city or polis and claiming for himself a different identity and a broader set of loyalties. Waterhouse depicts the first citizen of the world as an outcast, a citizen of nowhere, we could say, who cuts himself off from the bonds of sociability and the shared pleasures of community. To Victorian eyes, however, and maybe to our own, the adjective cosmopolitan would have applied much more readily to the fashionable women on the left, sophisticated types who even sport a delightfully anachronistic set of Japanese parasols and fans. Waterhouse's painting, therefore, not only offers us a fin de siècle snapshot of the origins of cosmopolitanism, but it embodies clashing visions of what cosmopolitanism might signify for different viewers. It shows cosmopolitanism caught between philosophical idealism on the one hand and worldliness on the other, between the desire to get to know foreign culture and ideas, so kind of an intellectual drive, and the sophisticated materialism that feeds on global commerce. My aim in this brief talk for the next 15 minutes or so is to provide a very short introduction to cosmopolitanism, its history, critical reception and relevance to literature, hoping that it may be a useful starting point for the network to develop its own specific interest in Scottish cosmopolitanism. While I am not an expert on Scotland and Scottish literature, I should say immediately, I hope that some of the issues that have come across in my own work on literary cosmopolitanism in the fin de siècle will resonate with colleagues who work on this topic. As we have just seen, cosmopolitanism has a long history that stretches back all the way to ancient Greece. The idea of world citizenship, therefore, predates by several centuries the invention of the nation, the nation-state and nationalism, to which it is nowadays typically contrasted. In its original formulation, Diogenes' iconic refusal to be bound by the narrow sympathies of the polis was a contravention of social and ethical expectations. World citizenship, as Waterhouse shows, comes into being as a category of resistance and non-belonging. In modern times, the philosophical cosmopolitanism 
um, has its apogee in the Enlightenment. The key figure here is the German philosopher Immanuel Kant, especially his two essays entitled Idea for a Universal History with a Cosmopolitan Purpose, that's one, and Perpetual Peace, a Philosophical Sketch, that's the other, both of them dating from the previous fin de siècle, that is, from the 1780s and 1790s. Kant posited the desirability of what he called a universal cosmopolitan existence that would enable people from all nations to join together in a great federation. Great federation are his own words, where the rights and security of all would be safeguarded. Kant, who also developed the idea of, uni of universal human rights, saw cosmopolitanism as a great political and ethical project that was integral to the realization of the civilizing mission of the Enlightenment. His writings would prove very influential and are still widely cited in debates on cosmopolitanism today as the trigger of this modern cosmopolitan moment that leads right into the 20th century. The 20th century, when the utopian project dreamt up by Kant translates into actual politics of internationalism, uh, embodied, for instance, among other things, by strands of international socialism and communism, and the founding of the United Nations after the Second World War. The end of the 20th century, the third fin de siècle of my title, marks, I think, another turning point in the history of cosmopolitanism, because it witnessed the real boom of discussion, again led by philosophers, that brought this concept once again to prominence within academia and beyond. I'm thinking here of works by Martha Nussbaum, Kwame Anthony Appia, Homi Baba and Bruce Robbins, just to name some of the most significant players. Different though they are, these thinkers are all essentially believed that some ideal of world citizenship could be reactivated in the present, albeit in self-critical and modified forms to address the problems and opportunities presented by globalization. The self-critical part is important, because these contemporary thinkers have interrogated the elitist connotations that accrued around the concept of cosmopolitanism in the course of history, and its overlap with free trade capitalism, um, um, as well as um, Eurocentric biases and limitations. So these critics are particularly important. What we witness from the 1990s is an explosion of cosmopolitanisms, now in the plural, to reflect a perhaps unlikely rapprochement between Enlightenment universalism and postmodern relativism. In my previous slides, our fin de siècle always appeared with a question mark, you will have noticed, caught between the historical milestones of the 1790s and the 1990s. Well, that's because the period around 1900 is usually bypassed in grand narratives of the history of cosmopolitanism. After all, the 19th century is, in Europe, synonymous with the apotheosis of the nation-state and nationalism. In the British context, the fin de siècle coincides with the period of high imperialism, the Boer War, jingoism, Kipling's writings, etc. However, as my work on this period, and I'm sure the Scottish experience will show, cosmopolitan idealism and the idea of world citizenship do not disappear under pressure from dominant discourses of the nation and the empire. Indeed, and this is one of the things that I've really come to believe in the course of my project, the history of cosmopolitanism and nationalism are intertwined. As nationalism grew in the course of the 19th century and became radicalized, so did cosmopolitanism's power of resistance. Its power, that is, to offer alternatives to the nation as an imagined community, to use a well-known term coined by the historian Benedict Anderson. The same goes for the empire. It is obvious that the British Empire was the stage for, politi for political abuse, violence and cultural aggression, propped up by nationalist ideology. 
but at the same time, the empire created the conditions for an unprecedented global movement of people, goods, ideas, and crucially, writers and texts from and to the European metropolis. And this traffic enabled the development of new ways of apprehending the world and one's place within it, which sometimes, as Lila Gandhi has shown, translated into sympathy and anti-colonial resistance. Sometimes, but not always, of course. In fact, it is not uncommon to encounter turn-of-the-century imperialists defining the empire as cosmopolitan. In other words, appropriating this concept. In this period, moreover, within the vast cultural landscape of the British and other empires, the idea of nationalism was often associated with progressive forces for the emancipation of oppressed territories, such as India and Ireland. The highly complex entanglement between such progressive nationalisms and ideas of world citizenship can be illustrated with a brief example from the Bengali writer Rabindranath Tagore. Around this period, Tagore repeatedly criticised nationalism, including Indian nationalism. In a 1917 essay, Tagore noted that the world was on its way to becoming one country, thanks to unprecedented advancements in science and commerce. Because of this, to him, inevitable trend, he takes it upon himself to educate Indians and people from other nations on how to become citizens of this new world. I quote, I have no hesitation in saying that those who are gifted with the moral power of love and vision of spiritual unity, who have the least feeling of enmity against aliens and a sympathetic insight to place themselves in the position of others, those will be the fittest to take their permanent place in the age that is lying before us. And those who are constantly developing their instinct of fight and intolerance of aliens will be eliminated. The few lines on, he writes, During the evolution of the nation, the moral culture of brotherhood was limited by geographical boundaries, because at that time those boundaries were true. Now they have become imaginary lines of tradition divested of the qualities of real obstacles. Tagore was of course deeply aware of British colonial aggression and condemned it, in this essay and elsewhere but his priority was to champion an ideal of spiritual reorientation that came with world citizenship. In so doing, Tagore drew on the moral arguments and the very language of European Enlightenment philosophy. But he also believed that the universalist idealism of that philosophy had been betrayed and, as it were, polluted by the history of colonialism. He therefore argued that in the new global age, Asian countries, such as India and Japan, should abandon nationalism in order not to repeat the mistakes of the West. In practical terms, too, the fin de siècle was a period of cosmopolitan opening, if by that we mean the desire and ability to imagine oneself as part of an interconnected global network in which ideas, texts and artworks, and of course people, circulate across borders. In fact, the end of the 19th century saw the setting in motion of globalization, I use this term obviously anachronistically, which people otherwise associated with the 20th century, no doubt because the First World War was seen to put an end to this internationalist momentum. On this slide, I've put some of the milestones of this process of standardization and internationalization, um, but I'm not going to go through them one by one. Obviously, all of this occurred within a growing culture of connectivity, aided by more efficient transport and communication technologies, travel, migration, international circulation of periodicals. What I want to stress, and this is also very much applies to the historical overview that I introduced earlier on, is that the real question to me is how these historical circumstances translated into lived experiences. What seemed important to people how did literature embody the relationship between the local and the global, the particular and the universal? How did specific authors and work address the ethical implications of world citizenship? 
How did they, for instance, represent patriotic feeling? In studying this embodied and material reality of world citizenship, literature and the arts offer an unparalleled archive that brings to life the texture of cosmopolitan experience. So I want to conclude with one last slide that sketches some of the possible points of convergence between theories of cosmopolitanism and literary studies. Conflict and discursivity. Cosmopolitanism is not a consensual term. As the experience of the turn of the 21st century shows, even proponents of cosmopolitanism disagree over its meaning and politics. In the fin de siècle, the word cosmopolitan was in fact often used in negative terms, even by cosmopolitan writers such as Lafcadio Hearn and Vernon Lee. I think that this is important because we should bring out the idea of conflict in order to reconstruct the discontinuity of cosmopolitanism that I have that highlighted in the beginning in my reading of Waterhouse's painting. This includes being aware of the problematic overlap in our period between cosmopolitanism and empire. I'm thinking, for instance, of the way that um, the Orientalism um, that we can see in Waterhouse is imbricated in an, an imperial mentality. My second uh, term on the slide is citizens of nowhere. Um, so in my book I use this formula to refer to the complex identity politics of world citizenship, that is the lived experience of practicing literature in an international space. Cosmopolitanism connotes both a special set of cultural and social privileges and special types of vulnerability. We should be aware of this paradoxical condition. Which leads me straight to my next point, which is beyond privilege. In the course of time, cosmopolitanism has become associated with social privilege. Think again of Waterhouse's fashionable women, so much so that it is a term that often causes embarrassment on the left. To study cosmopolitanism, however, means also to try to recover marginalized experiences of world um, uh, citizenship, such as, for example, migration. Defamiliarization. The, de the denationalized perspective of the cosmopolitan, think of Diogenes again, is a way of making the familiar strange and the strange familiar. Tagore, in my previous quote from Nationalism in India, praise those with the, quote, sympathetic insight to place themselves in the position of others. I think that this politics and aesthetics of defamiliarization is very useful to unpack the complexities of literary cosmopolitanism. Literary form, cosmopolitan encounters inspire literary innovation. It is important to keep thinking how domestic literatures are influenced by encounters with foreign voices and how literary works change form when they cross geographical borders. And finally, comparative practice. I think it's very difficult to grasp the dynamics of literary cosmopolitanism without a comparative approach. Of course, studying the philosophical engagement is important, but it risks abstracting the presence of the foreign other taking it out of history in the text. I view literary cosmopolitanism primarily as a materially embodied set of practices and aesthetic encounters that came into being as authors and readers studied foreign languages, read foreign authors in the original or in translation, travelled and worked hard to forge international connections and keep up with what was being written in other countries. I think that we need comparative approaches and the study of translation in order to reconstruct this international scene. To conclude, therefore, I am not sure that even 100 years on we can fully agree with Tagore that national boundaries are becoming, quote, imaginary lines of tradition divested of the qualities of real obstacles. To study cosmopolitanism, however, means, if nothing else, to investigate how those obstacles work and how we can overcome them in our critical practice. This is its challenge and its proposed new beginning. Thank you.